All right, guys, welcome. We're going to make some pizza. I uh, really appreciate everyone's support with this. This was a, a kind of fun idea that I came up with, and um, hopefully we execute this okay. But I really appreciate everyone's kind of support and enthusiasm uh, about this. So I also need to thank my boss, Bruce. We are in his kitchen today um, at the winery. And so he is always the, the gracious host, but he did say that I owe him a slice of pizza at the end. So uh, small cost to pay. Um, big thank you. You guys might not see Andre, but Andre is behind the uh, the camera today. He is going to help um, kind of hopefully coordinate all this techno uh, technology for us. So um, with that, with <laughs> there is a little disclaimer that Andre and I are only winemakers. We are we are not film producers or uh, podcast producers or we just we're not chefs, I think, especially. So this is kind of a, a new thing for us. We're definitely stepping out of our comfort zone. So um, please bear with us. But I think we'll have a, a fun time today. Um, please save all your questions for the end. That's kind of going to be the way this all works. I'm going to have every one of you guys muted for the whole time. If you guys would like to ask questions, you can please type them into the, the chat area um, on Zoom. And then also as well, I will open up at the end of the presentation um, and take uh, questions and answers at that point. So um, kind of to, to start off, um, I, I had a few different influences for me um, to kind of get me going with here. Um, the first one, this got me started about five years ago. This is called The Bread Baker's Apprentice, written by Peter Reinhardt. If you like bread, this is kind of the the textbook for it. It is awesome. There's it's it's pretty heavy reading, but it will show you how to make multitude types of breads and including a sourdough starter. And this is what kind of got me on that kind of going. Um, and then just about a month ago, I heard that this new pizza book was coming out, and it's called Pizza Quest. It's also by Peter Reinhardt, which is kind of uh, a weird coincidence. But he actually travels around the country and he's talking to different um, chefs of, of pizzerias and then tries to pretty much recreate each one of their kind of best recipes in this book. So once you get a little bit more advanced, a little bit more comfortable with your pizza making, this is a really good book to kind of like kind of try your push your, your boundaries and limits. And then kind of a, the last thing, which is, uh, you know, just a couple months ago, Food and Wine did a special pizza episode. And so... If you um, have kind of the basic knowledge of how to make pizzas, then you should be able to kind of understand the little nuances that they're, they're doing and the different kind of recipes that uh, they're doing um, in this magazine as well. Um, let's see. I do need to, I want to also give a shout out to um, Central Milling in Petaluma. They didn't sponsor me or anything, but they do have fantastic flour products. It's all milled there in, um, in Petaluma. This is the pizza flour that I'm using uh, today. They sell it in the, the five pound bags or 50 pounds if you're gonna kind of go really big. Um, and then, yeah, what we're gonna start, start doing, we're gonna start the, the presentation. So we have our three wines here today. Uh, we have our Parmalee Hills Zinfandel. We have our Tina's Block Zinfandel and Maple Vineyard. And then we have our, our Maple Vineyard Zinfandel. These are all 2017. so. They're not our current vintage, so I'm calling them a library, a library wine, but they're not super old. But what I'm going to do is kind of show you guys how you would treat an, an older wine and, and open it up for guests. Um, so I'm going to actually choose the, the maple today. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you we have this device called an ASA. And so this is if you're using older wines, the cork is going to eventually begin to deteriorate um, a little bit. So if you use a, a cork screw and actually screw in, you get a higher chance of the, the cork actually crumbling. So what you do, it has two little sides on here um, and you basically wanna slide it down one side of the cork. There's one that's longer and one that's shorter. So you go with the longer side first, slide it down in there a little bit until you can kind of get the other one on in. And then you basically have it both in there. And what you wanna do is kind of wedge on down, just kind of, Boop, 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 boop. And you're just going down, going down, going down. Yep. Until that point, it started kind of coming. And so then you do just a gentle twist and turn. Gentle twist and turn, nice and slow. 
until it finally comes out. And what we have here is a, just a very nice, you know, uh, cork that's about five, six years old. It's barely bled, uh, about a couple millimeters. And um, this wine probably could have aged another 20 years if we wanted to. And so what we're going to do is we're going to decant this wine because what's going to happen over the years of aging is that there's going to be a lot of sediment that is going to begin to form in the wine. So what we want to do is if we're serving it for guests, we're going to try and take as much of that kind of sediment away. So the first thing I would do is definitely stand your bottle up about 24 hours before, uh, before you go ahead and serve this wine. So that way it kind of allows the sediment to kind of travel on, on down. And then the next thing I'm going to do is kind of teach you guys this thing that we learned in school. It's called priming. And so I never, you never know how well the glass was clean before when you last used it. So what I like to do is you just pour a little bit on in and then go ahead and give that a real good shake. And so you want to shake it all around, try and get like wine on every part of that, that glass. And then you're going to throw that little angel share kind of right down the drain, or you can drink it if you wanted to. But what that's doing is that's making sure if there was any like soap residue or anything, any kind of weird residue that was in the glass, it's now completely wine that's with it. So we're going to go ahead and pour this. It's going to get plenty of air. I don't use usually um, any kind of like aerator or anything like that. Just by pouring it itself, we'll give it enough. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to leave just the last little bit of the wine in the shoulder of the bottle. And that's why these Bordeaux bottles are actually shaped the way they do. The neck is actually supposed to be used as a little bit of a catcher kind of right here. And so you're kind of hoping that the last couple bits will catch that sediment. And you'll have mostly clean wine right there at the end. And so, yeah, you can't see, but it doesn't look too bad. There's actually not too much sediment on that bottle so far. So, and, um, please pour yourselves a glass because this will I will always sound better with a little bit of wine in you so um everyone salute cheers to your life once again thank you I really appreciate the support guys oh man that's good okay so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the sourdough starter so I'm going to show you guys how I got mine started um what we do is we just have just flour and water. So it's kind of the most simple thing you can actually have. And we're not adding any yeast to it. There's only yeast that's um, throughout the air that's gonna land in it. And it's gonna be a natural fermentation in that, in that kind of sense. So what I have is 120 grams of bread flour. Um, I'll talk about the gram thing later with everyone, but we put that in there, pretty simple. You also have the same amount of water. You have 120 grams in there as well. Go ahead and pour that all in. And then what you're just doing, you're just, you're just mixing. So it's nothing too serious. It's not making like a big doughy dough. Um, it's gonna be kind of, kind of sloppy and liquidy, like a, kind of like a, a heavier kind of yogurt. And especially once it starts fermenting. So what you're gonna do is just kind of try and get everything all together, get it to kind of conglomerate. And then you're gonna wanna just kind of try and baby this thing. You're gonna actually wanna kind of check on it every day. And what you're gonna notice, we were right now, it did kind of turn into a little dough. So this, but it's not like a, it's not a, um, it's, it's just a little sticky. It's just not as, as liquidy, which is, which is good. Um, and so what's gonna happen is in theory, we're just gonna cover this up. We're gonna go ahead and leave it out until we notice that there's little bubbles, little bits of activity that's in there. And that's when you kind of can know that the, the natural yeasts are starting to work. And then according to kind of the recipe, what you want to do is then start adding an equal am uh, amounts of flour and water again to try and just keep giving it food and giving it food until eventually it is just almost overflowing um, out of this bin. And then what you're going to want to do is transfer that into, I usually use a, a plastic bin. So kind of just to show you guys again, this is what the starter at the beginning will look like. I tried one again, another, uh, tried another one here at the winery about two weeks ago. It took off, it took a little while to get it started. Um, one of the cool things that I, I read and I think it will help out is if you have just a little skosh of orange juice um, to add in, that'll actually give you just a little bit of sugar 
And that will also just kind of instigate or kind of um, get the, the yeast excited. So that will kind of help out your, your starter. But this is not like a quick process. My first starter took about, um, well, it took about two weeks until I thought that it was strong enough. And then um, I had friends over for a dinner party and what I thought was gonna be a nice uh, raised bread ended up being like a very thin focaccia. <laughs> and so um, it needed a little bit more time. So be patient, but definitely just give it a quick stir every day, recover it, just kind of uh, monitor it until you kind of start seeing activity. Um, and then once you do have it kind of all set and we'll, I'll kind of show you what, what mine currently looks like. Once you have it all set and you know that it's built up and active, then you can go ahead and, and set it in the refrigerator. And so here is, let me see where my little thing is. Here's my, my starter right here. And so this is a kind of a nice little Tupperware to put it on, a little bit of plastic on top. Um, you can see it's kind of gelatinous kind of thing. Um, and pretty much, yeah, what I did was go ahead and add a little bit of sugar to this. Uh, sorry, not sugar, added flour and water to this uh, a couple days ago and then just left it out of the fridge this morning. And that kind of caused it to go ahead and get activated, get ready to um, be entered into the dough. And so what kind of happens and what we're looking for is we're looking for the yeast. The yeast is a very crucial part. We definitely want to have yeast because what that's going to do is that's going to be able to give us the rise in the bread. That's going to give us our air holes. But we also want something else growing in there, and that's called lactobacillus. And that's a bacteria that's apparent everywhere. It's actually really big in winemaking as well. Um, but what we're doing with lactobacillus is that's what's actually going to give you the sour part. That's what's going to give you the sour to the sourdough. They're producing a little bit of acid, and that acid is going to show up in, in, the, um, in the resulting dough. So that usually happens a little bit more over time and it will continue to happen while it's in the refrigerator. So um, with the starter, there's been, you know, weeks on end that I've kept in the refrigerator without having, um, you know, without adding any flour or any nutrients to it. And then just kind of build it back up um, like about a day before that I, I know I'm going to need to use it. Um, and let me see. I guess that's, that's kind of, I guess the, the last thing is that I always like to name the, the starter. So this one was named Han Solo. I was kind of looking for, um, for a name and I couldn't figure one out. And then harvest started and I didn't know what to do with my starter. And so I, I put it in a Ziploc bag and I stuck it in the freezer. And as I stuck in the freezer, I kind of imagined those yeast and bacteria in there all of a sudden kind of being frozen in carbonite like Han Solo. So I came up with the name and it kind of kind of stuck. It's kind of my own little pet name. And so we'll get back to that later. We will go ahead and, and use that starter in the in the dough. And um, in, I guess right now it's pretty much it. And so on to some pizza dough. Um, the first thing that you guys probably noticed is that I put everything in grams. I'm sorry. I know it's kind of a weird wine making thing, but with all, a lot of these cookbooks that I was reading, a lot of them are done in, in grams and weighing. And for the, the main reason for that is the fact that if you poured out a cup of flour and I poured out a cup of flour, it would actually be different amounts just based on how we, weigh, how we measure things. But 500 grams of flour is 500 grams of flour for you. So it, um, it kind of is the most um, repeatable way. So when you are doing this recipe, you can now maybe add 50 grams here, take away 50 grams there. And it kind of gives you the way to be able to be a little bit more repeatable. Because even yourself, if you probably weighed out five cups of flour five different times, you'd have five different weights. So it's, um, so that's, that's kind of, I would suggest just investing in a, in a kitchen scale. It doesn't have to be anything too fancy here. And so um, what I'm going to do now, we are going to add in the flour. I just have a, a nice big metal bowl right here. Uh, we have 600 grams of pizza flour, and that was the same pizza flour that I showed you guys earlier. And we're just going to throw that on in. Boom. And then we have, I have 15 grams of sugar and 15 grams of salt. So salt always helps out. It's going to add just a little bit of sourness as well. 
um, to the, to the mix. And then the sugar will actually help out that lactobacillus ba uh, bacteria and will actually cause it to create a little bit more sourness um, by giving it that sugar. So you can kind of tweak with those as well. If you don't like it as sour, keep that sugar out of it. Um, you can also go lighter or a little heavier um, on the salt. And so with those dry ingredients, I'm just going to mix those all together. So you just don't get a big clump of salt or sugar at one point and that it's all kind of ingrained with everything. And then what I'm going to do is I turn on my scale now, put the flour mixture on there, and we're going to tear it out so that it goes back to zero. And then I'm going to weigh out 350 grams of this starter. So this is kind of the, the least precise kind of thing. And you, you can definitely go over a little bit or under, but um, this, this is kind of, I don't know, the, the best way to kind of do it. And you just kind of chunk it on in there and try and try and get the weight as, as best you can. So let's see, we got another little spoonful. Try and get about 350. Whoop. And perfect. All right, we're at like 360. So that's perfect. We went a little bit over on that, but I always say with the starter, that is 100% fine to do. Um, and so then what I would do just to kind of go back, one, what I would do is after tonight, I'd go ahead and add a little bit more flour, a little bit more water into my starter and then let it sit out overnight, get active, stir it up one more time, throw it in the fridge until the next time I'm gonna use it. So, um, so that'll be the end of our starter today. We have uh, a little bit of olive oil, 45 grams. I know that's also a weird thing to weigh out, but um, just bear with me once again. <laughs> and then we have 450 milliliters or grams of, of water. So um, I'm actually gonna take the scale away for now. And we're gonna just add that water in. So now we have all the ingredients that we're gonna need. This is everything. You have your, your starter, flour, water, salt, sugar, a little oil, but that's pretty much it. And what you're gonna try and do is just start trying incorporating it. So try and make this into a dough. So it's, um, it's not a quick process. Um, and just this last weekend, one of the, the things that I tried was actually using um, the KitchenAid, kind of the, the kitchen stand mixer. And that worked out really well. So if you do want to use your, your kitchen mixer with the, the dough hook in it, um, I think that's a, that's a smart way. I think it works out really easily that way. Um, but you can also do it by hand, which is usually how I prefer. There's always kind of just some, some certain fun, just kind of getting amongst it. And um, I don't know, I always kind of call it a little bit of, of, of a workout. And so this isn't going to be pretty. This, as you guys can see, this is just kind of clumpy, clumpy kind of mess. And so what you're eventually going to want to do is we're going to go ahead and put this onto a, a floured cutting board right here or any kind of floured surface that you have. So definitely don't be shy with it. Go ahead and grab a good clump, put it on your hands, put it on the, the cutting board. And what we're going to do is then go ahead and just try and transfer everything we kind of can, can from here get this kind of ugly mess all together. Now we kind of go. Okay, and so then more flour, guys, this is kind of, the more flour, kind of the better. And you just want to start working it a little bit. You're going to find there's some sticky parts, there's some non-sticky parts. But you want to go ahead and just start kind of mixing this together and squishing it down, stretching it out. Any way that kind of feels comfortable for you. I've seen a lot of professional people do it in a way that looks like really kind of cool, but um, I, <laughs> I, I haven't figured out besides just kind of mushing it to kind of together here. Um, and you can already kind of start to feel it kind of getting soft. It's kind of gonna try and kind of go from those clumps to being extremely smooth. And so um, what we're gonna do, just keep adding just a little bit more flour. And normally we would do this for 10 minutes. So this is gonna be just a little bit of a, a shortcutted process here so that we can uh, kind of make it work for TV <laughs> as we're <laughs> kind of calling it. Um, and so then the key for you guys is kind of the longer you can actually let this ferment, um, the better, the more flavors you're actually gonna get. And I also believe kind of just the, the better um, digestion you're actually gonna have because 
the more that um, these yeasts and bacteria are breaking down uh, proteins and carbohydrates in, in, the, in the dough, the, the easier it is going to be for your body to digest it. So I'm just going to do one more little dough thing here. And then what we're going to do is just kind of show you guys how I would then do it. Give me a sec to wash this stuff off real quick, guys. And then I'm going to take this bowl. We got another bowl here, and I will use a little bit of olive oil um, spray, just a little aerosol. Um, this will keep the the dough from sticking to to the bowl. Uh, I'm just going to spray that all in there, and then go ahead and and transfer your dough on in. Once again, it doesn't have to look pretty. It's not going to look pretty right now. There's going to be clumps missing, but go ahead and kind of get it all in there. And what I like to do is just kind of give it a good a little rub around so that gets all that oil. And what you're going to do, go ahead and grab just a little bit of plastic wrap, cover this bad boy up, and um, we're going to call it a day for that. So what you'd want to do, sometimes after about an hour, what I'll do is go ahead and um, take the dough out and go ahead and re-roll it because it'll be just a little bit smoother by then. And then what you want to do, like I said, ferment it for as long as you can. So I'll usually make the dough at least the night before. Um, and then I'll put it in my garage, which is kind of like a, not as cold as the refrigerator, but not as warm as our house. And so it kind of allows it to kind of do a nice slow fermentation overnight. Um, and then at that point, I'll go ahead and pull the dough out, knead it one more time, cut it into its 400 gram sizes. Um, and then at that point, you can either go ahead and stick it in the fridge, you can stick it in the freezer, which is fantastic, um, or you can go ahead and start getting your pizza dough ready for the evening. And what you'd want to do is take that 400 grams of dough and start um, roll it out with just a little bit of flour again, cover it on a on a board like this with a little bit of plastic wrap. And so, um, so yeah, so we're going to say goodbye right now to our, our little bit of, of pizza dough here. And this will be a, a nice future pizza for, for us. So. And so what we're going to move on to now is um, uh, we're going to go ahead and make the sauce, which is this really cool, simple, simple recipe. I kind of didn't know that it could be so simple. Um, I've used this brand, Cento. They're crushed tomatoes. It seems to work really well. Um, it's got a good flavor. You don't have to cook this sauce because the sauce has already been cooked when they, they can the tomatoes. So you can just make this, apply it directly to the pizza. Um, about a couple of weeks ago, um, my wife and I were at home making pizza. We had a ton of sauce left over, ended up that week making perfect sauce for, for pasta. So it can kind of be uh, very versatile as far as that goes. Um, and so then your, your other ingredients in here, I have a little bit of lemon juice, about one tablespoon. We have a little bit of basil and oregano. I just went with dried basil this time. We don't have fresh basil growing in the garden yet. It's almost almost going to be here. Uh, and then a little bit of garlic that I went ahead and, and minced up. So all you really have to do is just go ahead and um, put all these ingredients together. It also calls for salt and pepper. I choose not to usually add it to the sauce. Um, personally, I think that when you're doing pizza and you have the salt and the dough and then you know, we're going to make a, a sausage pizza later. So there's salt there, a little salt in the cheese. I don't feel like you need to make sure that your, your sauce is too salty. So I try and kind of uh, stay back on that. So we'll add a little bit of the lemon juice in there. Going to add the dried oregano and basil in there. Get a little bit of that garlic in there, which I love. Just, just fresh garlic, about three cloves. Just go ahead and kind of chop it up as quick as you can. And then that's it. We go ahead and we're just going to mix this together. And this is going to be the sauce that we're going to use today. This is, it's just kind of that simple. And so you don't have to tell people that, hey, I got this from a can. You actually made it, even though you pretty much are just adding like three ingredients to a can, which we don't need to tell anyone. So that's, that's kind of perfect. <laughs> So yeah, you just end up with a nice, nice sauce. It's it's perfect, nice and and kind of uh, real kind of fresh flavors in there from that Centro. I really like that that brand once again. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and set this quickly aside for a second. But 
This will keep up in the uh, fridge for about three weeks. So you can go ahead and just keep it covered in the fridge um, and it will, it will last that long. And I think it's time, it's time for pizza. It is <laughs> finally here. So um, let me kind of just scooch some things around and out and about. I'll move this around. So here was my beautiful dough from earlier um, that I pulled out. Um, I went ahead and just um, just rolled it, like I said, in just a little bit of flour, kept it covered in the plastic wrap for about three hours. And that's what it will look like. And so what you now want to do is go ahead and um, we're just going to roll it with a little bit of a flour again. Just go ahead and, and add some more um, onto it. And then we're just gonna start working it. So it's kind of just, what we're trying to do now is just kind of stretch it out just a little bit. There will be no tossing of, of pizza dough <laughs> in the air. Um, I haven't even tried it. I don't think my wife would let me try it in the house. So, um, and Bruce probably for that matter. So, um, so yeah, so you just kind of wanna um, go ahead and just kind of start stretching it out. It's not always gonna be a perfect um, circle <laughs> that like that it ever happens. And then I go ahead and I start putting it on the baking sheet. So I'm going to grab that baking sheet real quick. All right. So here we go with this. Got to turn it like that. And this will go over here. And so what I like to do is put just a little bit of the semolina flour on top. It's just kind of like a real granular flour. Um, and this just kind of adds um, our access kind of just like almost like a lubrication between the pizza and the, the paper. So you'll kind of be able to move the paper won't get or the pizza won't get stuck to the paper kind of this way. So I don't know, it's about a tablespoon that I kind of just put um, around. And then just to kind of go back real quick, I just have um, just a regular cookie sheet here that has parchment paper on top of it, just a, a sheet of, of parchment paper. And so what we're gonna do is go ahead and, and throw this dough now on here. And I'm gonna add a little bit more flour to it, of course. We're just gonna try and kind of spread that up and around. And what that's gonna do is now we're gonna go ahead and I'm, I'm gonna roll it out. And that's gonna make sure that the, the roller won't actually stick to the, the pizza itself. So we just kind of go and just roll it, roll it one way like this. I'll turn it. And so then it kind of goes the other way. And that'll kind of, I'll kind of give you your, your circular shape. You can kind of see it forming right now. Just kind of make sure nothing kind of blocks up. Um, and then, yeah, and then you kind of can start really kind of flattening it out um, as much as you, you kind of can. Turn it again. So as you'll see, it's, it, this is going to be a, a good, funny shape. I'm glad I'm proving my point here that it doesn't have to be a perfect circle. So, as you guys can see, so we got a kind of nice flat, I don't know, maybe it's a 12 inch pizza or something right about there. And what I'm going to do is just, I just kind of like push and stretch. And so this is going to kind of like form a little bit of your crust uh, this way. You're kind of flattening out the middle part of the pizza and kind of squishing any excess to the end so that you can go ahead and and get that like really nice crust, uh, hopefully on here. And so, yeah, if you're having troubles, what I would normally do is just add a little bit more flour if it seems to kind of be sticking a little bit much on you. And there we kind of go. That's kind of, all right, not bad looking guys. Um, and so now it's time for topping time. So first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna get this sauce back out. So we got the sauce. I said about three tablespoons. I'd say when you're making the pizza, this is when the like measurements get the most um, kind of wishy-washy as far as that goes. It's more of an eyeball kind of thing. Um, but the thing that I have learned from a few of these um, books is that less is more. So the less amount of toppings you actually put on, it's actually gonna be better for the pizza. You're gonna actually get a little bit more crispy on the, um, on the crust. You can imagine if you add too much sauce, it's just gonna get a little soggy. So I usually do about three spoonfuls um, on here. Just go ahead and kind of start spreading it around. Um, and pretty much go to, to the, 
the edges everywhere pretty much, but where you think that crust is, is going to kind of be. So, um, I go ahead and just kind of smooth it out with the, the back of your spoon so that it kind of just covers a little bit of everything. You get a little bit of the, the garlic, the basil, it's all, oh, it's starting to smell good guys. So I'm, I'm getting hungry now. There we go. Maybe three and a half here. So as you can see, this thing isn't just coated with, with sauce. It's got a nice little layer on it. Um, and we're going to make sure it's just not all too clumpy in one area or not per se. So there we kind of go with that. And then what I'm doing today, I gave you guys, let's see, I gave you guys three recipes for, um, for pizzas. And what I'm doing today is the roasted garlic and sausage. And so for our toppings, I have our, our roasted garlic, which um, what I did is you just take a whole garlic, cut off the, the bottom of it, put in foil with a little bit of olive oil and close it up that foil, and then stick that in the oven for about 45 minutes at 375. And it's not only is it one of the best smells just in the kitchen, it's, um, it also just makes for a great topping on pizza. So just having just roasted garlic, it's just always, um, I don't know, one of, one of my favorites. And it's pretty simple if you kind of have the time. Uh, a little bit of mozzarella. So always, I'll always put a little like kind of base layer kind of down, try and get uh, the cheese to kind of stick to the dough so that we're not going to have all of our toppings kind of slide off. So kind of just give a little light layer there. I'm going to go ahead and add these whole roasted garlic. So as you can see, I just kept, kept them out in chunks. Um, there is no perfect way to do this. Normally, you just have to throw everything on the pizza and then just kind of sort it out itself. Um, I find that's kind of the easiest way. It's just not it's not pretty, but it, it definitely gets the, the job done. And so we got the roasted garlic on there. We now have a little bit of ground sausage. Um, I did a mild Italian. Um, you can do whatever you want with this. This is kind of the, the fun part of pizza making is that once you get kind of the basics down, then you have like the multitude of options because there's so many toppings that you can that you can use and different types of pizzas you can make. And so kind of a fun dinner party that I like to do is to have all the pizza doughs ready, have a bunch of different toppings there, and then allow your guests to go ahead and make their own pizza with their toppings. Um, and so this kind of allows if, if the pizza doesn't isn't their favorite, it's kind of their own fault because they picked the wrong toppings. But it also it allows people to kind of personalize it um, a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to keep that much sausage. So sorry, guys. This will I'm going against what I said right there. Too many toppings. But um, oops, sorry. Then a little bit of Parmesan cheese. Um, this is once again where you could start going crazy. There is so many different types of cheeses out there that you can um, start experimenting with them. I think it's really cool. Sometimes like fresh mozzarella on there. Uh, my wife and I used to go to a, a pizzeria where they'd actually crack a, an egg in the middle. Um, so it's, I don't know, you can definitely start kind of uh, going a little, little crazy with it. All right, quick, quick wine break, wine commercial real quick. Um, okay. All right. And then I'm going to top it with that last little bit of mozzarella that we have. So we got ourselves a, a good looking pizza here. And so what we are going to go ahead and do, and I can't kind of show you guys this, but I have a pizza stone in the oven. It's a rectangular pizza stone. Um, I would highly suggest it for anyone. It helps keep the oven warm and then also will, um, go ahead and kind of crust up your, your crisp up your crust um, a little bit better. So you're trying to kind of replicate these old um, pottery kind of um, clay uh, ovens that, that people will use. And so there it is, there's, there's the pizza. So we, we, we got it all set. And so what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna use this baking tray actually just as like a, um, what you'd call a pizza peel. And you're gonna go ahead and just slide this whole part on into the oven. Um, we have the oven right now on at 450. Um, and so what I like to do, and you, you try and kind of crank the oven as high as you can is, um, 
I will go ahead and, and crank it up once the pizza's in. I think this helps out because then it starts up the, the heating mechanism. And so you're going to actually get quite a bit of heat going in on your pizza. Um, let's do this. Let's put this in. Let's see what happens, guys. All right. So we're just going to slide that right onto that stone like that. Close her up. And then we're setting a five minute timer, guys. And so what we're gonna do in the five minutes is we're gonna actually remove that parchment paper um, from the pizza itself so that it's just directly onto the, the pizza stone um, itself. Um, give me a quick sec. I can't believe we actually got that thing in. What do you think, Andre? Not bad. <laughs> Um, all right, so a quick talk um, about um, your different types of, of flour real quick. This is a type zero, zero. That's your highest level of protein. So basically the different levels of flour are broken into their protein level. And so that's kind of how much gluten is in there, which gluten is actually a protein. So it's not a, a carbohydrate. And so um, if you have stuff like you're making a cake, uh, a cake, or you're making cookies, you're using cake flour, that's going to have a real low, um, amount of protein in it, about 5%. And that's going to allow it to be really kind of spongy and soft, the higher amount of protein you have. So you then have, um, all purpose flour, bread flour, and then pizza flour is kind of the highest amount of protein in it. And what that's going to do, it's going to give you it, its shape. It's going to be able to keep its elasticity um to the to the dough and so that's why people will will kind of use that you can go ahead and start mixing in whole wheat flour um you could do different types sometimes people will use um just bread flour um this is my first time using a pizza flour and i've actually really enjoyed it i think it, it works really well before that i was just using um a bread flour so um so that's pretty much it about kind of flour and and how that goes I'm gonna talk just real quick about the, the different wines and kind of what I would uh, pair with these different wines. So we have the 2017, which was just like a great vintage. It was a, a fun vintage. It was definitely, um, it was a beautiful summer. We had a nice, cool summer. Everything was growing at a real even pace. Um, and then right around Labor Day, we actually had a pretty significant heat spike. And so, what that caused is it caused the sugar to drastically rise in the grapes. Gonna And it pretty much um, for, not forced us, but we had to go ahead and pick things maybe a little bit earlier because those sugars were rising so quick. So what happened is you ended up with a little bit more acid in these wines than you normally would because of when they were picked and how kind of like phenolically kind of ripe they were. So I always kind of knew that these were going to be fun wines actually to age this vintage, especially because of the high acidity to it. Um, and I think it's starting to show right now. So uh, I think it usually takes about five years of a wine aging, especially kind of the way that, that Andre and I will make it um, to, to go ahead and kind of like test that or stand the test of time. We make sure there's no oxygen getting into the wine and then plus all that that tannin that's in Zinfandel will also help um, kind of age it. But you almost need that kind of sediment to form that we were talking about earlier, because what that's gonna do is drop some tannins out. It's also gonna drop some of that acid out of the wine as well. So it kind of rounds the whole uh, wine itself. And so I think these 2017s, when they first came out, were just a little bit tight, I think is the, is the word we'll kind of use for it, that they would benefit from aging a little bit more. And I think they're starting to really kind of hit their, their sweet spot right now. So what, um, what I kind of came up with was a little bit of pairing for um, the, the three different wines with the three different recipes that I gave you guys. So the first one is the three cheese pizza and I chose uh, Tina's block with that. And so Tina's block, um, planted in 1910 it's 112 years old right now about 20 percent of it is um a field blend there's 80 percent zin in there but about 20 percent is a mix of cinso and carignan and petite syrah so there's some really exciting nuances to tina's block that some of the other wines don't have as much 
And so what I like to do is almost have like the most simple of a pizza that you can make that three cheese pizza, where you go ahead, you just have the dough, the sauce, a little mozzarella Parmesan, and then I chose white cheddar. You could also do Gouda. It depends how kind of strong you want that to go. But when you're pairing that then with Tina's, what that's going to do is actually a little bit of the fat in the cheese is going to go ahead and match the tannin that's in Tina's, and you're going to see other flavors kind of show up. A lot of those, once again, kind of nuances in there, you'll get a little bit of like floral and perfumey kind of things. And our five minute timer is up. So what I'm going to do real quick, guys, is I'm going to go ahead and just pull that parchment paper out. And then we're going to go ahead and set that timer for another five minutes for the pizza. So I have my trusty spatula here that goes ahead and I just kind of can hold the pizza pretty well. Slide this parchment paper out from underneath. Close her back up. And so, and then we got another five minutes before we got pizza kind of coming out of the oven. Okay. And so that's why Tina's block is perfect with that three cheese because it's actually Tina's is kind of like the focus of, of that kind of pairing. And so, and with that wine, it's just, it's it's amazing. The Parmalee Hills in Findel is probably one of my favorite wines to pair any food with. Um, I love it with lamb. I love it with big, strong flavors. And so it itself, it's it, it's planted in a real cool climate. So on the Sonoma coast, right by Car uh, Carneros, we get a lot of wind ripping through there. So it never gets really too hot. The, um, the wind actually causes the berries to kind of make a, a thicker skin. You're actually going to get a little bit darker, a little bit more tannin on it. But since it's in such a cool climate, especially compared to our home here in Dry Creek, um, it, the acidity is really high in this wine. So you really kind of got to pair this with something that's going to kind of match this. So the recipe I chose for this was our chicken um, pesto pizza. So you have the strong kind of herbal flavors of pesto being able to match kind of, I would say some of the savory kind of herb, herbal flavors of Harmony Hills Infidel. And what that's gonna do is hopefully if they match, you're actually gonna see a lot more fruit flavors kind of shining through on this Parmalee Hills. You'll start seeing uh, a little bit of strawberries, a lot more red fruits in the Parmalee Hill than, uh, than maple and, and teen is, um, but yeah. Definitely go ahead and, and make the, the chicken pesto with that, that Parmalee Hill. And then the last one, the one that, that I've been drinking is the, the Maple Vineyard Zinfandel. And that is what we are going to go ahead and, and pair with this roasted garlic and, and sausage pizza. This is kind of the classic. I, I just kind of love thinking about this. The fact that a lot of our Zinfandel in this area comes from Italian immigrants that started coming during the gold rush. So I try and think like how many times has this pairing been made in, in Maple's history that someone's ate a, ate a pizza while drinking some Maple Zinfandel. So uh, I feel like we're continuing something <laughs> along here. Um, and so what I really like about Maple Vineyard is it's mostly Zinfandel. You get just a little bit of Petit Syrah in there. And so you actually get like a good texture to this. There's definitely a good amount of, of tannin. I always think of Tina's having a little bit softer, more approachable kind of tannin, where this, this maple is, is grippy. It works well with the steak. It works well the, with a little bit of the fattiness from the, the sausage and the kind of strong flavors of the, of the roasted garlic. Once again, you're gonna see a lot more fruit flavors actually showing up um, in this wine because it's being matched by the, the flavors in the, uh, in the uh, pizza, basically. And so this 2017, we actually started picking right after Labor Day. Like I said, when we had the heat spike um, with a lot of our other vineyards, what we'll do to mitigate that is go ahead and just turn on irrigation to the, the vines, just like watering your grass before a heat wave or anything like that. But with Maple Vineyard, there is no irrigation. Everything is dry farm. There's not, not a drop being used from a reservoir for any of these vines. And so you really have to monitor um, those grapes pretty much <laughs> daily at that time when it starts getting that hot. Um, and so we made the decision, go ahead and pick, uh, I believe it was September 3rd. Usually we have about a two week window that we'll go ahead and pick through. This ended up being about a one week window. Um, like I said, the sugar started getting pretty high. 
Um, but once again, with when I go ahead and can actually create the blend of maple, because we did pick it on a bunch of different days. We did put it in a bunch of different tanks um, as far as using an open top tank that's like used for Pinot Noir or like a closed top tank that's used normally for Cabernet. And those kind of different winemaking techniques are actually going to produce a few different flavors and kind of textures so that at the end, usually about a year after we've made these wines, we'll go ahead and taste all these barrels and decide how we want this, this blend to be. And so um, with me making this blend in the last 12 years, I kind of think it's a fairly consistent wine year to year um, for that reason that I'm just trying to make the, the best wine um, out of it. And I have about a hundred barrels that I need to choose our 40 best out of. So um, it's definitely one of my favorite things for, for winemaking. And just to get back real quick to lactobacillus, I kind of mentioned it earlier that we also use it in winemaking. It is the bacteria that will um, convert malic acid in wine to lactic acid. So I know we talk about malolactic fermentation a lot in Chardonnays. It's definitely a big flavor contributor to Chardonnays. But what people don't normally talk about is that every red wine actually will go through that malolactic fermentation. So when we're talking about a natural fermentation of, of sourdough here, where we're just literally waiting for yeast and bacteria to fall from, from the sky onto our, onto our flour, it's kind of the, the same thing when it happens um, for wine. If we just had a big tank that was just crushed grapes, if we left it there, eventually yeast and bacteria would go ahead and start fermenting it. It's usually our job to go ahead and try and control that. So um, let me just take a quick peek at this pizza. Let's see how close we are, guys. Woo! Looking good. So I'm going to give it a couple more minutes, though, guys. And so kind of the, the thing that I've learned, and this is another thing for you guys to kind of work on, and as you guys kind of keep making pizza, um, try switching the levels um, in your oven that the oven rack is on. The, the goal the, of, of pizza making in theory, or the, the cooking of the pizza, is to try and have the crust and the toppings kind of all brown at the same time. So it's, it's not a perfect science. So I've learned personally, if you have your pizza too high up in the oven, your toppings are gonna start getting browned and done before the dough is actually done. So a lot of times the lower I've kind of gone in the oven, um, the, the more success I've, I've kind of had. And there is no kind of perfect science as far as um, this is how, you know, the pizza should look at the end. Um, I just look for it to just be just, yeah, a little brown. You'll see the cheese kind of start to brown up a little bit. And then you also start to see the crust also just get a, a little bit brown. But it's once again, it's never perfect. So please um, don't be too hard on yourselves about it. That maple is good. That maple is good. Oh, wow. Okay, so what we are going to do is get get this little cutting board ready because we're going to hopefully put the pizza right onto here. So what I will use is I have my spatula. I have my cookie uh, sheet. I'm going to go ahead and try and just put that um, pizza slide back onto that, that cookie sheet and then slide the pizza back onto here. Try and make sure... Probably you just have a little bit of flour on here just so that nothing sticks. Um, but yeah, all right, let's give it one more look. Let's see what's happening. Woo. All right, one more minute. That's how I always am. I feel like it's always a tough thing. Just so <laughs> it's one more minute. Um, I'm gonna take a quick minute to thank my mom real quick. She was the one that got me that Bread Baker's Apprentice as a, a birthday gift. She somehow saw that I would definitely uh, love kind of fermenting my, my own starter and everything like that. Um, and so I, I just want to give her a quick thank you. She was kind of my inspiration as far as this goes. Um, and it, it goes back to, to my high school days where uh, my mom went back to community college and got her culinary degree when I starting when I was about 14. She ended up interning uh, for patisserie and, and Paris. Uh, we ended up visiting her out there. So that is the, the side where I get this kind of uh, my wine making influence was definitely a big part from my mom going back to school and also just kind of teaching me. And then she is always the constant experimenter in the kitchen. So 
I kind of think a big per, uh, big part of me actually making pizzas. I don't think my mom ever made pizza. So it's kind of well, one thing I can say, maybe I made better than my mom. Um, but there went the timer guys. Okay, here it comes. Oh, daddy, -o. that looked right to me. Okay. Whew. All right, guys. Okay. Hey, not bad. All right. So here we go. We got a little bit of browning on this crust right here. Looks pretty good. Got a little browning on the uh, the tops of the cheese and a little bit of the garlic and and sausage. So that that looks that looks pretty right to me, guys. I'm I'm actually pretty stoked how that turned out. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and slide that onto that yep, cutting board. Okay, stick this away. Whew. Quick little wine break one more time, guys. I can't tell you, it's about 85 degrees outside here in Healdsburg. And then we're on the second floor of the winery, which I think adds about 10 degrees. And then we have this wolf oven that's about 500 degrees in this little room. And it is just, <laughs> Andre and I are just basically in a little, little steam room here. But um, the key is also for this, go ahead and wait about five minutes to have it kind of cool down. Everything's gonna be just a little bit um, melty, if you will, before you kind of um, cut it up. Um, and then usually at this point, I'm going ahead and I have that next pizza ready and you're just throwing that right into the oven, um, usually about one at a time. So, um, so as far as like a, a dinner party is concerned, it is a little bit tough to have everything be ready all at once and everyone sits down. But I personally love how it kind of works out for a dinner because you can maybe start with the cheese pizza. It almost acts as an appetizer for everyone while they're kind of standing around. You could then have the next two pizzas kind of at uh, as a, the sit down kind of aspect of it. But yeah, it works well. The, the, the key to this is that my, my kids love it. Everyone seems to like it. And so even if you have picky eaters, um, a lot of times you can go ahead and everyone, everyone likes pizza for the most part. So, um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go ahead. I probably didn't wait the full five minutes, but I'm trying to make sure real quick, I kind of got everything covered. What do you think, Andre? How are we doing? All right, I love it. All right, fantastic. All right, hold on. Hold on. So pardon the, the plastic plate guys, but big part once again of our job is going to be giving this to Bruce. So we gotta make sure that that guy is happy. And so what I'll usually do is go ahead and just cut this into six slices. So what that usually means is just go ahead and try and cut it in half. So I also suggest a handy dandy, handy dandy pizza slicer is always key. And go ahead, you can kind of turn your pizza just a little bit. I'm gonna cut it in half again. Let's see if this will stay together one more time. Oh, beautiful, baby. There we go. Boom. All right. There we go. And so now what we have here is just a beautiful roasted garlic we got sausage on there nice little mild spice to it we have our own homemade sauce to it and then the star of the show will actually be the crust at the end because there's just a beautiful salty kind of sour taste to that sourdough crust that always kind of it makes you want to eat the crust i was never a big crust guy but this is always kind of what, what made it to it and so we're gonna go ahead and i'm gonna sit this to the side right now and i believe i'm gonna open this up for q a and so if anyone has any questions, any comments, um, anything like that, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Please everyone be patient. There might be a lot of people on there. So if um, everyone kind of uh, figure out all, not all at once kind of thing. But um, before I do that, just a quick thank you again to everyone. Uh, this has been so much fun to prepare. I can't believe that it kind of went uh, this well. Um, once again, just, just a winemaker who likes to make pizza on the weekends, but, 
Um, I thought this was a cool thing that I knew enough about to be able to go ahead and kind of share with you guys. So kind of thank you. This actually, once again, kind of got me out of my comfort zone here. And it, it feels really good to kind of kind of do something that's not 100% winemaking with it. And so, um, so I just got to say thank you for letting me kind of share this with you. And then, yeah, Andre, if you want to maybe like, if you can turn your screen around so maybe I can see if anyone's kind of asking the question per se and and then go ahead and um anyone fire fire away make sure to unmute yourself, yourself as well. well oh sorry what go uh, ahead andre go, can you just read it yeah so someone wants to know what kind of sausage you're using the brand and the flavor cool, cool. So, so yeah i think this one was kind of like a um can you, mute, can you mute yours? There we go. And so um, I use just the the New York style mild Italian. So uh, I just found it at our, our local Safeway or our Rayleigh's. Um, and this is where you can go ahead and kind of like really experiment. I think you could definitely go with a little bit spicier. You could go with a, a plain sausage and add your own fennel and your own other spices that you kind of want to like mix with it. Um, and then the other thing you could also do is just get literally link sausage, cook link sausage, and then cut that into slices, kind of like a, kind of like a pepperoni would be. Um, but yeah, this ground sausage ended up being kind of not what I normally think of when I say sausage on pizza, because usually I think it's like a, a perfect shaped little ball that kind of goes on there. But, um, but yeah, kind of the, the ground sausage goes ahead and kind of like just becomes part of the pizza that way, more like kind of a like a ground beef kind of wood as well. But you could go ahead and make it more substantial and make it into kind of a meatball. You could kind of do things like that. So that's kind of uh, part of the experimenting for sure. All right, Andre, what others? Um, someone wants to know about our, our chemistry glassware. Uh, I, I love it. So yeah, so here we go. Uh, this is a couple of fun little things. This is a little Erlenmeyer flask right here. Uh, this is just a, a standard beaker. I thought it would be pretty cool because we do have these um, around the winery. Um, Andre and I will use these in, in our lab setting if we're going to be either, I don't know, we don't use them too much, but you never know when we, when we do, basically. Uh, and then we just put a little lab tape on there, and that's kind of how we will we'll label different things. But, um, but kind of like a fun little trick, and I don't know if this is quite common knowledge, but one gram of water is equal to one milliliter of water, which is kind of like the basis of the, the metric system. So when I say 450 mils of water, you could actually also weigh that out and be like 450 grams of water as well. And so once again, this is kind of why I use the metric system. It's how we do it in the, in the wine industry ourselves. I won't tell Andre to add a cup of something, it will be a, a certain very exact precise weight to it. Um, and then the same thing kind of goes when we're doing like volume measurements. So um, I would say something bigger like this, this Erlenmeyer flask, we'll go ahead and use this for like blendings. Um, for example, like that maple vineyard. So let's say we have about five different lots of Zinfandel. We'll go ahead and maybe add, you know, 100 milliliters of each of those lots and just see what that kind of finished wine, just everything blended together will taste like, and then we can kind of, you know, kind of go from there. But, um, but yeah, I just kind of thought it would be a fun way to be able to kind of show you guys how um, all the ingredients have everything as we call mise en place, everything in place, um, ready to go. And that's what kind of made this quick. It was actually pretty quick to um, make this pizza and it kind of, kind of blew my mind. So, all right, Andre, what's next? Are we, we looking good? Looking good. I love it. Well, folks, um, you'll see an email from me again, because hopefully um, this was recording the whole time. I'll put this onto our YouTube channel. And so if you would like to share it with friends or family or teach them how to make pizza, that would be completely awesome. Um, and I believe I will keep the three pack deal going for maybe one more week. I think we have about five cases of each of the wines left. Um, so there's probably enough for you guys each to have like a three pack or so. So if you did really enjoy these wines or you wanted to recreate this kind of setting that we did with those three wines and other family members and 
turn on the YouTube and everything like that, you can totally go for it. Um, but if you also have just any questions offline, please go ahead and email me. I've already chatted with a couple of you and I, I absolutely love it because it's just a, a fun interaction where once again, I don't think there's a really a correct answer. It's just all of us kind of trying to, to have, have fun here. And then the other thing is also, if you did make a pizza tonight, or if you do try this out in the future, I would love to see your pictures. That would be awesome. I would just get a real kick out of that. So if you could email me those, that would be uh, really cool as well. And then also, if you guys have ideas for the next one, I need to figure out what this next Zoom is, is going to be. But um, in the meantime, I wanted to let you guys know also that we just finished our new outdoor um, kind of patio area. If you haven't been to our meet in a couple of years, it's kind of the time to set a date. We have a bunch of new um, experiences for you guys to kind of taste out here. We're also going to be offering a, um, a barrel tasting with a winemaker, which is always kind of fun because we didn't kind of have those barrel tasting events this year. We're just going to kind of do it in a, in a personal kind of matter. And I wish you guys all the best. I hope you enjoy the wine. I hope you enjoy the rest of the pizza. I hope we all learn something. I hope we got fuller and I hope Bruce is happy at the end of this. So, but um, I would want to thank Andre again. Thank Bruce again. Thank my wife. She put up with all this pizza nonsense for quite a while. And then <laughs> thanks to you guys. I really appreciate it. This was so much fun and solid. Cheers to, to life and to, to great wine. And until next time, guys, cheers.